Hello, I'm Mike Smith, a former editor of The Age. I'm talking today to Ben Hills, the biographer of the legendary editor of The Age, Graham Perkin, of the 60s and 70s. Hello, Ben. Hi, Mike. How are you? Congratulations on a rattling good book. It uh, should be on the shelves of every journalist and every journalism student. Why is it important to remember Graham Perkin? Mm, well, thanks for that generous introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm fortunate there's not as many journalism uh, students or journalists as there used to be, but um, hopefully we'll sell a few copies. Why is he important? I think the message of, of Graham Perkin, the principles that he, that he used to drive his paper, are probably just as relevant now as they were then. I wonder if I can give you a little taste of this. Yes, please. This is what he said uh, way back in the 1970s about the, uh, the kind of newspaper that he was trying to produce. He said... We're trying to produce a different kind of newspaper, popular newspaper, but one with quality and breadth. It'll look at the whole world, at all people. It will attempt to spread understanding and encourage decency, discourage inhumanity and attack prejudice. Will it sell papers will be one test, but not the only test we apply to editing tomorrow's paper. We believe there are news stories that people ought to read even if they're the stories they may not want to read. The paper will express its own opinions as forcefully and clearly as it can. We will try to leave no doubt where the age stands on issues and principles. Those who disagree will find us eager to publish their views. We will continue to employ writers, cartoonists and commentators who work with complete independence and integrity. Now, you won't hear many editors using those sorts of words today but the principles that Perkin espoused are just as relevant. It's a philosophy that could well be applied to a quality broadsheet uh, 40 years after he wrote that. Yes, absolutely, Mike. Yes, it could. You've described him as the greatest Australian editor of the 20th century, uh, and I don't hear anybody arguing with that. But uh, who do you think would be the medal winners in that race? Look, that's a good question. Um, unfortunately, you know, one of the reasons why I did this book is, is because there's so little written about our great editors, so little. I mean, every little tin pot footballer who ever trotted onto the field and or won a Brownlow medal has got people queuing up to do his biography. Every little politician, all our um, uh, international um, authors, in fact, are doing uh, autobiographies, but no editors among them. I, I did a, a very thorough search, the only editor I can find is probably the only one who could lay any claim at all to challenging Graham Perkin. And that's the man who uh, didn't quite found, but was the earliest and greatest of all the editors of the age, David Syme. Right. But now, he, was, he was more than 19th century, though, wasn't he? <laughs> well, he was. And, and by the time the 20th century dawned, he was pretty much in his dotage. He was in his 70s and 80s. Since then, the only other person whose name you ever hear mentioned in the same breath as Graham Perkin is Adrian Deemer, yep. a very great editor of The Australian in the, uh, in the 1970s. Not the founding editor, but the editor who made it popular and who drove those principles that Perkin was espousing. You and I were very lucky to have worked in, uh, in what might be described as the golden era of Australian newspapers, and we were both very lucky to work with Graham Perkin. Mm. I was just a kid. I was just a star-struck kid um, that held him in great awe and fear and uh, he was a great uh, leader and a, a daunting boss, but uh, you were much older. You were his gun reporter. Uh, what was it like to work for Graham Perkin? I, you quote David Austin, another fine journalist, as saying working with Perkin was like batting with Bradman. What was it like to be his gun reporter? Mm, you've, you've stolen my best line there, Mike, <laughs> damn you. <laughs> I came up from Tasmania. I think I'd caught his eye. Um, during coverage of the uh, of the Tasmanian bushfires of the uh, uh, mid to late 60s. Um, he, uh, he was very daunting, very intimidating the first time you met him. He had these piercing blue eyes, this matted down hair, which was almost like a skull cap. His wife later told me that he used to achieve this effect because he would get out of the shower and put a football beanie on his head to flatten his hair down. He was, in those days, curls weren't fashionable. They were seen as being a bit effeminate. And so he wanted to be as formidable as possible. And he had a booming voice. You knew when he entered the newsroom and 
took his seat at the desk at night that he'd arrived. Yes, oh yes. And, uh, and, and the energy and the angel dust was sparkled. Mm, that's right. He, he, would, um, he would dominate a room. He had, uh, it's a terribly cliched word, but he had charisma. Some of Perkins' uh, biggest achievements, I guess, uh, right up there would be um, instilling and generating a culture of uh, investigative journalism at the age that, that still exists today. You were the head of the Insight team for, for many years. What were some of the big ones? Oh, my goodness me. That's a very hard question. He's, he's often called the founder of investigative journalism in Australia. That's a wee bit of a mistake because David Syme himself had been an absolutely gung-ho reporter. I mean, he had got himself in all sorts of bother way back in the 19th century by, for instance, attacking the Commissioner of Railways for putting branch lines to nowhere to benefit his mates. Got involved in huge libel cases. And really that tradition, although it had fallen into disrepute before Perkin came along, had always been there. Yep. But Perkin reinvented it, reinvigorated it, appointed a full-time team to go and do it. We started to come up with stories, and I'm by no means the only person who was doing this. There were people like John Tidy and John Larkin, who were the first Insight reporters there. And I, when I left the age to go overseas, um, the torch was handed on to people like David Wilson, who, mm. who were great reporters in their own right. Um, the stories that happened on my watch, I guess, that are most remembered are stories that led to the downfall of governments on both sides of politics. In Victoria, um, we began a series of investigations into corruption in the Victorian Housing Commission. Yep. They'd been uh, basically paying kickbacks to people whose land was being acquired for public housing. And that story probably contributed, was a factor in the defeat of the Hamer government in the 1970s. This is after Perkins' death, the story kept going. The other story, um, the bird is on the other foot, probably the uh, Whitlam government's downfall. The chain of events that led to that was triggered by the age. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But others included the campaign that uh, Perkin ran for justice for the Thalidomide children. I mean, like, like many uh, in the, uh, of, of the Insight uh, style of stories, it was modelled on the Insight team of the Sunday Times that was run by Perkin's old friend uh, uh, Harold Evans. Uh, there was a campaign for the minus children, intellectually handicapped children in Melbourne that brought great change. Um, a whole uh, stream of stories and, uh, and the tradition does continue today. Yep. Finally, Ben, what, what do you think Perkin would do with today's broadsheets, with the challenges they've got now with the internet? And like he, he would be reaching out towards the internet with both hands. Do you know where he'd be today? He'd be on a plane. He would be on his way to New York to sign up Julian Assange and WikiLeaks as the as the as the age's new prime investigative unit. That's where he'd be. Yeah, yeah. Look, he was uh, he embraced new technology. He embraced television before most journalists. Yeah. He used television to advocate not mm. just for the paper, but uh, but for himself and 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 for press freedom. Mm. Uh, I'm sure he would have been an early adapter of the internet. Uh, he wouldn't have uh, pretended for 10 years that it didn't exist. No. Uh, he would have used it to connect with readers. Uh, it's a perfect way to connect with readers. So. I'm, sure his, I'm sure his strategy would have been quite different from the strategy of today's newspaper management. And, and don't forget that if he had lived, the, the very day that he died, he was on his way to Sydney where he was going to be appointed chief executive of Fairfax. And it's very interesting to speculate on the different direction that Fairfax might have taken if he had taken over. And I'm quite sure it would have been a different company today. I'm sure that they would have, he would have seen the threat of the internet coming and would have moved quickly to, to colonise that space and to transfer the value of those great mastheads, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and the Australian Financial Review to the internet, instead of which the Fairfax board just sat there like rabbits in the spotlight while the internet ran over them. And I'm sure he wouldn't have let inside the door uh, people like Warwick Fairfax or Conrad Black. I think he would have done his best to stop them, although, you know, uh, the voting power that, uh, that, that young Warwick commanded after he persuaded his siblings to sign their shares over to him might have been pretty <laughs> formidable. And I tell you what, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of Mary Fairfax either. <laughs> <laughs> ben, I think we'll finish with a clip from an ABC television interview uh, Perkin did, what, what, 40 years ago. Yeah. 
talking about um, the definition of a muckraking newspaper. It was one of the last interviews he did. It was with the ABC's Checkerboard program. And if you watch this and listen to what he's saying, these principles ought to be inscribed on every newsroom wall in this country and on the walls of every faculty of journalism in this country. So we'll let Graham have the last word. Thank you, Ben Hills. Thank you, Mike. Are you prepared to run stories which may offend readers, which may lose your readers, because you believe it's in the public interest, because you think believe it, you believe you're performing a public service in doing it? The role we've consciously tried to adopt is the role which uh, I believe is uh, fulfills the Aegis tradition, and that is as a campaigning newspaper. I believe that uh, that muckraking is a is a legitimate newspaper function that if there's muck to be raked, then it's a newspaper's responsibility to get in and rake it, because I believe there are a few other institutions in the community which can, can do it. Our attitude has been, in the eight years that I've been editing the paper, uh, to campaign where we find issues in which we believe uh, uh, there is public interest involved. Absolute objectivity seems to me to be probably unattainable. I think everybody, whether you work on a newspaper or not, has built-in beliefs and prejudices, uh, which have obviously got to control. Uh, if you're talking about newspapers, convictions and prejudices and beliefs affect the judgment he makes on stories, on the treatment of stories, on, on the words in stories. I hope that uh, the people that uh, we try to bring into journalism these days are people with convictions and with beliefs. You know, I don't particularly care for people who uh, who believe in nothing, who are complete cynics of, uh, about the world. I, this, uh, these people seem to me to be positively dangerous. But what I would, uh, uh, rather than use the word objectivity, I, the, the word I would use was, is balance and fairness.